2001 was a watershed date in the end times. More specifically, September 11, 2001. The date when the two towers in New York City came tumbling down and a plane crashed into the Pentagon, killing over 3,000 people. 2003, a terrible heat wave hit Europe. What you might not know is that as a result of that heat wave, 72,210 people died in the summer of 2003. 2004, the Asian tsunami, more specifically December 26, 2004, off the west coast of Sumatra. It was an earthquake, 9.0 on the Richter scale, that caused a tsunami that killed 225,000 people, injured one million, and left millions of others homeless. It was the third largest earthquake ever recorded. Some witnesses say that the waves reached a height of 98 feet. It's hard to conceive of a wave that high. 2005, Katrina. More specifically, August 29, 2005. Because we live in a country where there are evacuation plans and there are shelters and we have a well-organized team of rescue individuals, the death toll was only 1,833. It would have been much higher if it had been in another country. The hurricane caused $81 billion in damage. 2005, the Kashmir earthquake caused death to 73,338 people. 2008, tropical cyclone Nargis, more specifically on May 2, 2008, killed 138,000 people. 2008 also, in Sichuan, China, an 8.0 earthquake took place, more specifically May 12, 2008. 70,000 people killed more than 18,000 missing. At least 18 million people left homeless. $146 billion in damages. 2010, Haiti. More specifically, Port-au-Prince, January 12, 2010. A 7.0 earthquake killed 316,000 people. 300,000 injured, a million left homeless. 2010, Chile, February 27, 2010. In fact, 8.8 .8 earthquake on the scale of Richter, sixth largest earthquake ever recorded. 2011, Japan, Northeast Japan. More specifically, March 11, 2011, 9.0 earthquake that caused a powerful tsunami, killing 15,839 people with 3,642 missing, 1,525 injured. The tsunami caused a major nuclear disaster. An entire city was swept away. Those of you who remember watching on television could see the cars being swept away like toys and that water coming over the retention wall and going more than a mile inland. 2012, Hurricane Sandy, 
more specifically October 29, 2012. This was the largest Atlantic hurricane on record. Not the most powerful, but the largest on record. 250 people killed and once again the reason why the death toll is smaller is because of the country where it hit. Approximately 80 billion dollars in damage. I have not included in this list fires, tornadoes, floods, droughts, famines, and pestilence in the last 10 to 12 years. And then of course fresh in our memories are the events that took place at the Sandy Hook Elementary School. 26 people killed, among them 20 children in first grade. Something is happening in this world and you would have to be blind, deaf, to not see that something momentous is happening in this world. You know, in the aftermath of the shootings, of the shootings there at Sandy Hicks Hook School, I couldn't help but be amused, maybe I shouldn't use that word, but amused at the explanations that were offered in the media on the reason for this terrible catastrophe, this terrible massacre. I'd like to share some of those explanations of why this happened. All of these are actually documented in newspapers or came across the television. There is a New Age explanation and that is that in the evolutionary process when we transition from one age to another there's always a traumatic period in between one age and the other. See they say we're about to enter the age of Aquarius. You probably heard in the news media that we need more strict mental health screening. That perhaps that was the reason why this individual went off the deep end. If we'd had better mental health screening, it, perhaps it wouldn't have happened. And then there are those who say the reason why this happened is because of guns. If we could just ri get rid of the guns, then you wouldn't have this type of massacre. Others blame the violent media culture, video games, violent television programs, and violent music. Still another individual said it was because of parental neglect. I heard at least one person say that it was God who did this. In fact it made me think of what that um, French poet once said, Baudelaire. He said if there is a God, if, if there is a God he's got to be the devil. Many people blame God for what happened in Sandy Hook and what is happening in the world. After the school shootings, someone who I'm sure you've heard of, uh, Mike Huckabee, who used to be a Baptist preacher uh, turned political commentator, uh, came and offered an explanation saying that abortion, gay marriage, no prayer in public schools, no Ten Commandments in our courtrooms is what led God to allow this to happen. And so there are all sorts of explanations about why the school shootings took place at Sandy Hook and why all of these things are happening on a global scale precipitating more and more every day. But you know what? There is one explanation which is notorious for its absence. I never heard anyone on television 
or in the newspapers say that these, these things have been caused by the devil. Interesting that no one would blame the devil. You know, it's interesting that many people in the world today don't even believe that there is a devil. I would dare say that many of those who are involved in the media, they might believe in the existence of God, but it's doubtful whether they believe in the existence of the devil. The devil is the hidden culprit. And we're going to notice that the devil has a specific agenda in causing these things. He's allowed to do it by God because human beings have said, we don't want you, God. And so the Bible tells us that God withdraws his spirit and consents to the desires of people. But God does not cause these things. They're caused by the devil, allowed by God, because human beings have said, we don't want you in our life, they've said to God. Now the interesting thing is that when things get really bad, and believe me, things are going to get worse, we haven't seen anything yet. Ellen White says that the most vivid imagination cannot grasp the things that are soon going to transpire in this world. You can imagine the worst and it is still going to be worse than that. Soon, when things get so totally out of control that none of these explanations will actually be satisfactory, the blame game will turn nasty. It will turn upon God's people. I'd like to read you a statement that we find in the book Great Controversy, page 592, where Ellen White discusses the, the real issue involved in the reason for all of these things that are happening not only in the world but more specifically in the United States. And you say, Pastor, what you're saying could never happen in the United States. What Ellen White writes could never happen in these United States. Listen to what she says. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order interesting that those who keep the commandments of God will be accused of enemies of law and order. Those who honor the Bible Sabbath will be denounced as enemies of law and order, as breaking down the moral restraints of society, causing anarchy and corruption, calling down the judgments of God upon the earth. Their conscientious scruples will be pronounced obstinacy, stubbornness, and contempt of authority. They will be accused of disaffection toward the government. Ministers who deny the obligation of the divine law will present from the pulpit the duty of yielding obedience to the civil authorities as ordained of God. In legislative halls and courts of justice, commandment keepers will be misrepresented and condemned. A false coloring will be given to their words. The worst construction will be put upon their motives. Could that ever happen in these United States of America? You know, you heard what Dr. Teske said this morning about suspending constitutional rights. Most people don't really know about this because it was somewhat done like the Patriot Act. 
where most of our congressional leaders did not actually read the Patriot Act before they voted on it. Now some people say, well, Pastor Bohr, when you talk about these things, you're just an, an alarmist. Notice Great Controversy, page 605. Ellen White here is speaking about the final warning to the world. And she says, heretofore, those who presented the truth of the third angel's message have often been regarded as mere alarmists. Their predictions that religious intolerance would gain control in the United States, that church and state would unite to persecute those who keep the commandments of God, have been pronounced groundless and absurd. It has been confidently declared that this land could never become other than what it has been, the defender of religious freedom. So anybody who talks about end time events and you know the dangers represented by the union of church and state, the growth of the papacy and the apostasy within Protestantism is accused of being an alarmist and not speaking in harmony with the facts. I'd like to invite you to go with me to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 24 and verses 6 through 14 probably wonder you're saying, Pastor Bohr, can it be possible that eventually the scapegoat that is going to be blamed for all of the disasters that are taking place, in other words the arguments are going to morph from all of these other, other uh, reasons for the disasters in the world, that all of this is going to morph into accusing those who actually keep the commandments of God? Matthew chapter 24 has the answer beginning with verse 6 and you will hear of wars and rumors of wars see that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass now notice but the end is not yet so there's going to be wars and rumors of wars but the end isn't yet notice verse 7 for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. So there's actually going to be wars. And then notice, and there will be famines, pestilences, that means diseases, and earthquakes in various places. But now notice, this isn't the final development. Because it says in verse 8, all these things are what? The beginning of sorrows. Wars and rumors of wars. Nation against nation. Kingdom against kingdom. Famines, pestilences, earthquakes. In, other, in the Gospel of Mark it speaks of tumults. That means social unrest. And we're told that this is just the beginning of sorrows. So if this is the beginning of sorrows, what is the end of sorrows? What is it that is causing these things? What are human beings going to perceive as the cause? Notice verse 9. Verse 9 begins with a very important word, the word then. In Matthew 24, this word is used constantly, then, 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 because it's, it's describing a sequence of events. So after speaking about wars and rumors of wars, kingdom rising against kingdom, nation against nation, famines, pestilences, and earthquakes, and tumults. And after saying that this is the beginning of sorrows, notice verse 9. Then they will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. And you will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Is there any connection between wars and rumors of wars and nation against nation and pestilences and famines and earthquakes and tornadoes and all of these things and eventually God's people being blamed for it? Matthew 24 makes it very clear. And then verse 10 tells us that when this persecution comes, 
something is going to happen with what Ellen White says is the majority of people in God's church. Do you hear what I said? The majority. In verse 10 she says, and then many will be what? Offended. That simply means that they will not walk with the Lord anymore because of what the previous verse says, because of the persecution. And notice, we'll betray one another and we'll hate one another. Ellen White amplifies that, that parents will deliver their children. You say that could never happen. The blame game. Let me tell you, when things get really bad, people will do strange things out of fear. There's not a greater motivator among the wicked than fear. And there's not a greater motivator among the righteous than love. So it says, then many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. And then we're told in verse 11, then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. What are the false prophets going to say? In the light of what we're looking at, they're going to say, hey, do you know why this is happening? Because of them. Verse 12, and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Can you imagine a world where there is no love? You know, you think about the time of trouble when God's Spirit is withdrawn from the earth. That's the moment when probation closes. Ellen White says that man can be very cruel when he's devoid of the Spirit of God. We can thank the Lord that the Holy Spirit is still working today. <coughs> because if not, it would be the law of the jungle. And it will be that way. And if God should not intervene to preserve His people, no one, there would be no flesh left alive, according to Matthew chapter 24. We can thank God that God still restrains the winds of strife, even in this world where things seem to be falling apart. Now I'd like to read you a passage from the book Great Controversy, where Ellen White is commenting about what we just read in Matthew 24. She's not saying anything new that is not in Scripture. She's simply uh, putting flesh and bones on the principles that we studied from Matthew chapter 24. Listen carefully to what she says. This is Great Controversy, pages 589 and 590. Satan works through the elements also to garner his harvest of unprepared souls. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature. Can the devil manipulate weather? Can he cause earthquakes? Can he cause famines and pestilences? Absolutely. He has studied the secrets of the laboratories of nature. And he uses all his power to control the elements as far as God allows. When he was suffered to afflict Job, how quickly flocks and herds, servants, houses, children were swept away, one trouble succeeding another as in a moment. Listen carefully now. It is God that shields his creatures and hedges them in from the power of the destroyer. But the Christian world have shown contempt for the law of Jehovah. And the Lord will do just what He has declared that He would. He will withdraw His blessings from the earth and remove His protecting care from those who are rebelling against His law and teaching and forcing others to do the same. Now listen carefully what I'm going to say. In the end of time, What's going to happen is that it's going to be a, God's faithful people are going to be blamed for, what's, for all of the natural calamities that are taking place. And what the ministers are going to say is, God is angry 
at us. Because we have allowed them to exist contrary to what God has established, honoring Jesus by keeping Sunday in honor of His resurrection. Unless we get rid of them, things are going to continue getting worse and worse. So in order to appease God, what an image of God, folks. In order to appease God's anger, we have to enforce Sunday observance. What kind of image of God is that? Earning God's favor. You know, an Adventist are accused of being legalists. <laughs> There's no greater legalism than saying that, you know, if we behave ourselves, you know, if we forbid abortion, and by the way, I'm against abortion, and uh, if we forbid gay marriage, I'm against gay marriage as well, and all of these things, you know, but if we do that, then God is going to favor us again. We're going to earn His favor, and we're going to turn away His anger. Ellen White continues saying, speaking about Satan, he will favor and prosper some in order to further his own designs. And he will bring trouble upon others and lead men to believe that it is God who is afflicting them. While appearing to the children of men as a great physician who can heal all their maladies, he will bring... Now listen, this hasn't exactly happened yet. He will bring disease and disaster until populous cities... What is a populous city? Sanger? I have nothing against Sanger, by the way. Selma? No, I would not consider those populous cities. Los Angeles? San Francisco? New York? Etc. Yeah, that too. She says he will bring disaster, disease and disaster until populous cities are reduced to ruin and desolation. Even now he is at work, she says, in accidents and calamities by sea and by land, in great conflagrations, that means wars, in fierce tornadoes and terrific hailstorms, in tempests, floods, cyclones, tidal waves, and earthquakes. In every place and in a thousand forms, Satan is exercising his power. He sweeps away the ripening harvest, and famine and distress follow. He imparts to the air a deadly taint, and thousands perish by the pestilence. And now comes a critical point in her quotation. These visitations are to become more and more frequent and disastrous. Because people say, oh, there have always been tornadoes, there have always been earthquakes, there have always been diseases, there have always been wars, right? Not like we're seeing in the last few years. She says very clearly, more frequent and disastrous. She says, destruction will be upon both man and beast. And then she quotes from Isaiah 24, 4 and 5, the earth mourneth and fadeth away. The haughty people do languish. The earth also is defiled under the inhabitants thereof. And then, and then it explains the reason why the earth is defiled. Because they have transgressed the laws, changed the ordinance, and broken the everlasting covenant. So after speaking about all of these things that Satan is going to cause in the world, then she says this in the next sentence. And then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. Remember the days of Elijah? This is nothing new. Three years it hadn't rained. And so now Elijah comes before King Ahab. And what does King Ahab say? King Ahab says, Oh Elijah, we have sinned against the Lord. And that's why all these calamities have fallen upon us. No. 1 Kings chapter 18, 17 and 18 says, Then it happened when Ahab saw Elijah 
that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And he answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed the Baals. Of course, Baal was the sun god of Phoenicia. So Elijah says, nothing doing. I have not caused the famine and the pestilence in the land. You have, because you have forsaken the commandments of God. Ellen White continues saying in the statement in the Great Controversy, then the great deceiver will persuade men that those who serve God are causing these evils. The class that have provoked the displeasure of heaven will charge all of their troubles upon those whose obedience to God's commandments is a perpetual, refuse, uh, a perpetual reproof to transgressors. Interesting. It will be declared that men are offending God by the violation of the Sunday Sabbath. That this sin has brought calamities. What sin? The desecration of the first day of the week. That this sin has brought calamities which will not cease until Sunday observance be strictly, shall be strictly enforced. And those who present the claims of the fourth commandment thus destroying reverence for Sunday are troublers of the people, preventing their restoration to divine favor and temporal prosperity. Interesting. You know, when we're taken before, before courts, because we're going to have to appear before courts of justice, according to Jesus in Matthew 24, in uh, Luke chapter 21, in Mark 13, which are parallel passages, we're going to have to go before rulers and kings and presidents. Are we so well versed in the scriptures that we can actually explain why we observe the Sabbath? Are we well versed enough that we'd be able to answer some of the objections that are raised? You know, there's an individual who used to be a Seventh-day Adventist Bible teacher who left the Adventist church and now publishes a magazine that probably many of you receive where everything that he believed before he now criticizes. And basically his life mission is to destroy everything Adventist. And I believe you know who I'm talking about. But recently I'm talking about Dale Retzlaff. I'll mention his name because probably it's public knowledge who he is. But you know, if you read his latest publication, you know, he uses two arguments that uh, appear to be quite plausible concerning the reason why the Sabbath no longer needs to be kept. He says that Sabbath is not a creation institution. Because nowhere in Genesis do you find God commanding Adam and Eve to keep the Sabbath. It says God rested. It doesn't say that God told man to rest. How would you explain that? Biblically. Ah, okay. That also he says his second argument is that, you know, there was no evening and morning of the seventh day. Every day had an evening and morning. No evening and morning, seventh day. So he says, the, the, Sabbath, the Sabbath rest never ended. You can enter God's rest any time after that. How do you explain why there was no evening and morning of the seventh day? Is there some biblical theological reason? You know, these things are going to be brought up. And we need to be able to offer an explanation. I heard some of you giving the correct explanations. You need to come to prayer meeting. That needs to be a New Year's resolution. I'm serious. The last two prayer meetings we studied about these two arguments that are used against the Sabbath. There are clear biblical reasons that contradict these two arguments, but we have to be able to articulate them. 
I'd like to invite you to turn with me to 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 12. Why is there, why is it that, that God's people are not being persecuted today? You say, well, things aren't bad enough. Well, maybe that's part of the reason things aren't bad enough, but the question is, why are not things bad enough? The Apostle Paul says the reason why. 2 Timothy 3.12, and by the way, I'm going to do part two of this presentation the last Sabbath in January. We're going to see a pattern in Scripture. Here the Apostle Paul says, yes, and all who desire, better translation would be all who will, it's a decision of the will, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus might suffer persecution. Thank you. What is the cause of persecution? Living godly in Christ Jesus. See, that's what the devil's going to hate about the end time generation. That's why he's going to awaken the religious world against God's people, because he hates the fact that they're revealing the true piety that God expects of his people. The devil hates that. But he's the hidden culprit. Notice Matthew 5 verses 10 through 12 and then it will end by reading a statement from uh, Great Controversy page 48. Matthew 5 verses 10 through 12 gives us the same reason. Why persecution? It's because of the piety of God's people, their connection with God, which reveals the character of God and the devil hates that. It says in Matthew chapter 5 verse 10, Blessed are those who are persecuted for what reason? For righteousness sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. See, why are you persecuted? Because of what? Righteousness sake. Blessed are you when they revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my name's sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You know, people in the world today are confused. You know, I travel a lot. I meet people in airplanes, in airports, in evangelistic meetings. People are perplexed and they are confused. They know that something momentous is happening, but they can't put their finger on it. They can't explain it. As Luke says, their hearts are failing them for fear because of the things that are coming upon the earth. But as Adventists, we know what's happening. And we know what is going to happen. In other words, we have the message that can really bring comfort to the hearts of people to explain what's happening and what's going to come. All people need to do is read the book, The Great Controversy. There it is all laid out. In the light of the past, the present, you can clearly see where everything is moving in the future. Are you aware of the fact that the Pope has uh, said that there needs to be a um, uh, central authority that will govern the economy of the world? Are you aware of the fact that in Europe there are numerous organizations that are pushing for a Sunday law that will cover all of Europe. The Pope is pushing for that. Things, incredible things are happening. What is God waiting for? God is waiting for us to get serious about Him, to live pious lives. And you know what? If we were living in harmony with God's word and what, with what we find in the spirit of prophecy, persecution would awaken just like that. I finish by reading a statement from Great Controversy, page 48. Ellen White quotes this verse that I just read from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. 
She says there is another and more important question that should engage the attention of the churches today. The Apostle Paul declares that all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Why is it then, asks Ellen White, that persecution seems in a great degree to slumber? Listen to our answer. The only reason why does persecution slumber? Oh, there, there's ten reasons, right? No. She says the only reason is that the church has conformed to the world's standard and therefore awakens no opposition. And then she explains the religion which is current in our day is not of the pure and holy character that marked the Christian faith in the days of Christ and his apostles. It is only because of the spirit of compromise with sin. Because the great truths of God's word are so indifferently regarded. Because there is so little vital, vital godliness in the church that Christianity is apparently so popular with the world. And then she says, let there be a revival of the faith and power of the early church and the spirit of persecution will be revived and the fires of persecution will be rekindled. So what is God waiting for? God is not exactly waiting for more earthquakes and more floods and more tornadoes and more wars and rumors of wars and more pestilences. He's waiting for God's people to make a total commitment to Him and form a personal relationship with Him. And then in revealing the character of Christ, the devil will be furious and end time events will transpire very quickly. Now in scripture we find this pattern time and again folks. Revival, persecution, revival, persecution. In the second part that I'm going to share with you on January 26, we're going to go to several passages from scripture that illustrate this same principle that I've described this morning. Where you have a commitment to Christ and immediately afterwards you have persecution. In other words, there is a link, there is a connection. You say, well, uh, better not to live piously, that way we won't be persecuted. Believe me, it's going to come anyway. Sooner or later. The purpose is not to attract persecution. The purpose is to form a personal relationship with Christ, which as a result will bring persecution. Is our relationship with Christ so strong that nothing and no one would shake our allegiance to God. Are we at that point? Are we studying God's word as we should be studying God's word? Are we praying such as we have never prayed before? Are we taking advantage of every opportunity to witness to others? Are we faithful in our stewardship? Are we investing in God's cause? Or, only, or are we only just giving a donation rather than making a total commitment? Are we attending church on a regular basis? How about our prayer meeting attendance? You know, we have fairly good prayer meeting attendance. On a good night, we might have 40 or 50. But I see more than 40 or 50 here. I'm not rebuking you. I'm admonishing you. <laughs> Some of the best stuff that we study is at prayer meeting. Right, Pastor Jensen? It's like, a, it's like a classroom. It's school. It's not preaching. It's study. Questions are asked. Comments are made. We have prayer together. We present prayer requests, our praises. It's a beautiful experience. But we always have the same regulars. Praise the Lord. We praise the Lord for the regulars. But we need to pray for the irregulars. 
that the irregulars will come to prayer meeting. It's a very important boost to our spiritual experience in the middle of the week. That should be one of our New Year's resolutions. One, another one of our New Year's resolutions should be to read more of the spirit of prophecy. How about making up our minds like I've challenged the last couple of years, reading the five books of the conflict series. You know, if you only read 12 pages a day, you would be able to finish all five books in one year. Patriarchs and Prophets, Prophets and Kings, Desire of Ages, Acts of the Apostles, and Great Controversy. Twelve pages a day, you would read all five books in one year. Your life would not be the same at the end of the year. I guarantee it. This is the greatest Bible commentary that has ever been written. Hands down. It covers the whole Bible from the origin of sin in heaven till God creates a new heavens and a new earth and sin no longer exists. It is a complete Bible commentary from beginning to end. Spectacular, magnificent. I can't find enough adjectives to describe the beauty that we find in these books. And yet how many of us are actually opening them to read them? We need to shake off the dust off those red books. Of course now we have them in the computer. So let's shake off the dust from our software and open up these books. There's so many things that we can do better in the new year. And I pray to God that we will resolve that we're going to get serious about the Lord and we're going to make an unreserved and total and complete commitment to Him. How about it? Is that what this congregation wants? Would you like me to pray that this would be a reality? Let's pray. Father in heaven, we're living in momentous times. Since I was a child I've been hearing that Jesus is coming soon. My parents heard for years that Jesus was coming soon. My grandparents heard during their lifetime that Jesus was coming soon. Here we are in 2013. Jesus hasn't come, but as we look at the world, He can't be far from coming. Father, we long for His coming. We're tired of living in this world of sin and suffering and strife and sorrow and sickness <laughs> and death. It's time get to get down to business. It's time for Jesus to come. Help us, Lord, to realize the times that we're living in. That through your Spirit you will impress our hearts to make an unreserved and total surrender and commitment to you and to your cause. I ask, Lord, that the New Year's resolutions that are made in our hearts and in our minds, we might be able to live up the, to these resolutions, not by our power, but because each day you remind us through your Spirit about the importance of these things. We thank you, Father, for having been with us in our reflection this morning. We ask that you will hear our prayer, for your people ask it in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. We have this hope. And number 214, we have this hope. Shall we stand?